verse 11 to verse 18. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised, that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray together. Jopin, Galatians chapter 6. Verse 11 to 18, and I want to say one thing, one thing really. Um, If you're a Christian, aim for the cross in your life. Keep the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ before you. If you're not a Christian this morning, I'm going to say a, a subset thing, which is begin at the cross. Begin life by trusting what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Here's the issue here. How, and you and I, if we're Christians, how can we stay on the road of gospel freedom? That's what Paul is concerned about in the book of Galatians. Somebody has called it the Magna Carta of Christian liberty, Christian freedom, the freedom of the gospel. In the last chapter, chapter 5, Paul has been exhorting the the Christians in Galatia to live by the Spirit to walk by the Holy Spirit and all that he's uh, leading them towards. How can you and I make sure that we are keeping in step with the Spirit on the road to gospel freedom? And Paul here really says one thing, aim for the cross. As a church, aim for the cross. Imagine you're doing cross country. Maybe you're doing it in Dog Eklai, just down the roads. You've got a cross-country teacher. There's a new cross-country route. You've got to run through the mud and the mire along this valley. You're worried a bit about getting lost. And at the end of the valley, there's this church spire sticking up. And uh, the cross-country teacher says, aim for that. Keep it, keep it ahead of you. Keep it in view and navigate by it. Work out where you are in relation to it. Keep it in front of you and you won't go far wrong. And in effect, that what Paul is saying here, there's this little church. What is going to stop them from getting mired into slavery? What is going to keep them on the path of the gospel? It is keeping the cross of the Lord Jesus in view. Look at verse 11. Paul says, what large letters I'm using as I write with my own hands. Paul is writing to these Galatians because he's concerned for these younger believers, that they won't lose their freedom, that they won't be persuaded to adopt circumcision and, and obedience to the law of Moses as the badge of really belonging to Jesus. And throughout the the letter, if you know it, Paul has used really strong tones and strong language. He's talked about his authority as an apostle and the authority of the gospel he preached to them. He's talked what it means to be right with God through faith in Jesus alone. He's talked about the work of the Spirit in their lives and freedom. And now in the close of the letter, Uh, Paul's letters, he normally dictates to a scribe. 
And uh, here, very often, there's a bit in some of the letters where he might wrote, write with his own hand. But here he writes a lengthy bit with his own hand. He grabs the pen and he writes with large letters. He's so passionate. He so wants to underline what he's saying that he writes with his own hand. And he gives them one last exhortation and a blessing to stay on the road to gospel freedom. Uh, and he ends the letter where he started. In chapter 1, he talks right away, verse 3, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. So Paul began with the cross. He began with the fact that Jesus Christ the gift of God the Father, but he himself willingly gave himself for us to rescue us from this world in all its evil, in all its pride. And now at the end of the letter, he returns there again to stay on the road of gospel freedom is to aim for the cross. Because you and I as Christian believers, there's something in our hearts we always want to veer off course. We always think, well, look, Jesus died for me, but surely there's something that I can add to that. There's something that I can bring to the table. This was the issue with the Galatians and circumcision. They wanted to rely on their own works and the law. Or we might veer off to the other way and think, well, I can do what I like if I'm right with God through Jesus. And we veer off the path. And Paul is saying no. And it's a, it's a, a, a word coming down throughout history to every Christian and every church. Keep the cross in view. And it's surprising. It's surprising because Paul is saying to you and I, if you want to uh, assume, if you want to make sure that you live a life of freedom, of truthfulness and goodness, what you've got to keep in view is a first century torture instrument. It's baffling, isn't it? If I was giving you directions or I was giving directions to my children for life and said, what you really got to do is think about the electric chair. That's what you've really got to do. Or if you, what you've really got to do is to think about um, uh, the firing squads and, and then you'll live a good life. You see, that's, that's weird. That's odd. But Christianity has got this note to it that 33 AD, Jesus Christ was tortured and put to death on a hideous Roman execution instrument. And is that, that is the compass for our lives. It is that that redefines what we think about salvation and what we think about God. What do I mean by saying aim for the cross? I don't just mean like the cross as a religious symbol. Some people like having crucifixes and religious art up in their homes as if just the symbol of the cross uh, exerts some kind of mystical influence. I don't mean that. I don't mean aim for the cross as keep the cross before you as something that's kind of just um, nostalgic. Oh, we look back to the cross. I used to be in a choir um, when I was growing up in this Anglican church, and you'd have funerals where people would sing, I'll stick to the old rugged cross, and they'd get a bit dewy-eyed as they sing it. They'd walk out the door, and they'd never go to church ever again. The, the, the cross is something nostalgic that you look back to. And we don't mean the cross as um, to the expense of any other Christian truth, like aim for the cross, but... Don't think about the resurrection. Don't think that. Or aim for the cross, but don't think about who God is as Trinity. Don't think about that at all. What do we mean? If I am on to stay on the road of Christian freedom, it means that as a Christian, what happened on the cross, what Jesus did there, and what it means for my life are to be front and center in all my thinking about Scripture, in all my thinking about God, in all my thinking about this life, 
The cross, the event of what happened there, as Jesus laid down his life and took on the curse and punishment of the law that I deserve, that has got profound implications. To stay on the path of gospel freedom, churches and Christians need to live a life that is centered on the cross and what happened there and is shaped by the cross and what happened there. And this is so, so important because you and I wander off. So we need to listen to Paul blazing with passion as he grabs this pen and writes with large uh, letters, aim for the cross. And in aiming for the cross in your Christian life, there's two things essentially that Paul says here. First thing is this, don't avoid the cross. Don't avoid the cross. As a Christian, as churches, don't avoid the cross and the implications of a cross. I'm one of three brothers, not not the sons of thunder uh, at all. Uh, But me and my brothers, we are really good at putting things off. We are really good at avoiding things. I wonder if you are as well. If we've got a job to do, Uh, We find lots of other things to do before we do it. When it was homework, maybe you were like this when you were at uni, with you've got a deadline. You've got some people who kind of meet their deadline uh, and start working on it immediately. Some people put it off. Avoidance tactics. And there are really good ways of avoiding things. Uh, And human beings are, are quite good at avoiding the things that they don't want to do. You can either completely ignore it or you can put something else in its place. You can take yourself up with something. Now, there were these teachers coming into the church, Jewish teachers coming into the church of Galatia. They had lots of credentials, and they were saying, look, if Paul told you about Jesus, that's good. But if you really want to be part of God's family, if you really want to be sure you're right with God, You've got to get circumcised uh, and you've got to obey the law of Moses. That's where the real action is. That's the real thing. And Paul is saying, he lifts the lid in verse 12 to 13 and he shows what's really going on. These people are avoiding the cross. They're avoiding the implications of the death of Jesus in adopting circumcision as their mark. They are rejecting the mark of the cross and what that means. Look, and they're doing that in three ways. Look at verse 12. Paul says they want to make a good impression outwardly. They want to please people. They want to please the Jewish community that they've come from. So you get circumcised. They care about what's on the outside and what people think of them. And the cross is different from that. Because the cross says what really matters is you being right with God. That's the only thing that matters. But you and I can avoid the implications of the cross by thinking, well, what do people think? What do uh, mum and dad think? What do my brother and sister think? What do people at work think? We can be very controlled by other people. And so we back away from the implications of what it means to put Jesus first and trust in his finished work. Look, they want to avoid the cross in another way as well. Look, he says, the only reason they do this, the only reason they want you to be circumcised is that they want to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Now, the cross of Jesus is an offense It says that the only way to God is trusting in Jesus and his finished work. No other way. These false teachers, Paul says, wanted the Galatians to be persecuted because they wanted to avoid that, wanted them to be circumcised because they wanted to avoid persecution. We can understand that in a couple of ways. First of all, in the early church, One of the issues was Jewish persecution of Christians. So if these uh, Gentile Christians get get circumcised, well, the Jews are fine with that. They'll avoid getting persecuted for it. But I think we can also say as well, in the first century world, um, you were to worship Caesar in the Roman Empire. You were to put Caesar first. And there was only 
one exception to the worship of Caesar, and that was circumcision for the Jews. But now here with Christianity, you get something new. It comes from the Jewish scriptures. It says that Caesar is not Lord, but it doesn't get circumcised. And it is something completely different. And it could well be that part of what motivated these Jewish teachers was like, well, look, if you, uh, if you get circumcised, you can make like, life quiet for all of us. Just go along with it. And Paul sees the real issue. The real issue is the offense of the cross and what Jesus has done. They are trying to avoid persecution. And you and I can avoid the implications of the cross because we want to please people, but also because we want to fit in. And we don't want a quiet life. Uh, we, don't, we want a quiet life. We don't want to get persecuted. We, we want things quiet. We want to go along with things as they are. But the cross of Jesus says the only way, the only way. And look, Paul puts his finger on it even more in verse 13. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. He shows the contradiction of their view. Those who adopt the law, who are trying to get you circumcised, they don't keep the law. None of us keep the law. That's why we need to be saved. They want you to be circumcised so they can boast about your flesh, about human achievements, about you and what you've done. So they want you to be circumcised so they can go back to their friends and say, way, I got 30 uh, circumcisions today. Great, 30 people signing up. Brilliant, aren't we doing well? They want a show. They want to boast in what they have done and what they have achieved. And we tend to avoid the cross in the same way as well. The, the cross says that I am so bad that Jesus had to die for me. I'm so loved that he was glad to die for me. But the only way that I can be right with God is through what he has done and nothing that I bring to the table. And instinctively, we want to bring something. We want something that we can say, this is our own. This is what we have done. I want to boast in my church attendance. I want to boast in some moral achievements. But it's Christ alone who saves. And that wiring of the human heart to care about what people think, to avoid what is inconvenient, and to boast in our achievements. Uh, Paul exposes that. The cross exposes that. That's an expression of sin in the lives of these false teachers, and that the church are very tempted to go along with. Cross avoidance. And we might say that if this morning, if you're not a Christian, and you haven't given your heart completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that because you're trying to avoid him in some way? You're trying to, even in church, trying to back away from the implications of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Don't avoid the cross, says Paul. Come to the cross. Jesus alone. Find in him your um, center. Those who hear his voice confronting them today, reject the tempting choice of doubting or delay. Come to Christ. But if you're a Christian this morning, Paul says, don't avoid the cross. I'm a great avoider of things that are inconvenient to me because I'm a sinner. And you can be a Christian and we can wriggle out the implications of the cross in our lives. There's a Christian singer called Matt Redman. Uh, He's got an old song, Show Me the Way of the Cross Once Again. He says something very, very challenging in that song. He says, I've crafted myself a more comfortable cross. And we can make the Christian life more comfortable for ourselves. Can you see yourselves in this cross avoidance? I want to appear good to other people and my friends and neighbors. I want to avoid things that are difficult inconvenience. I want to have something in my Christian life of my own that I can boast about. 
the amount of people who go to church, the great number of people I got to go along to a harvest supper, something that I did, something that I did. I want something of my own to bring to the table. And in doing that, I'm doing the same old game of cross avoidance. Don't play that game. Don't do it. There's no freedom. There's no joy. Don't avoid the cross of the Jesus of Jesus Christ. Instead, Paul says in verse 14 to verse 18, adore the cross, adore the cross. We've got one of the great statements of the New Testament. Paul says, but may I never boast. May I never boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christian writer John Stott says this of the word boast. There isn't a, a direct translation of it from the Greek here. Uh, the word he uses means to boast, to glory in, to rejoice in, to revel in. The object of our boast, our glory, fills our horizons. It absorbs our interests. What we boast in is the, is the very center of our lives. It's the very fabric of our being. We revel in it. We all boast in something. Welcome to, to North Wales. This is the land of railway enthusiasts, particularly around here, Porth Maddock. There's all kinds of different enthusiasts you can be. I'm not knocking you if you're a, a railway enthusiast. I had a friend who had to go to the station uh, to deliver some stuff at a shop of a local steam railway association. And there was a guy there who started following him around the platform, a train enthusiast looking at the, the Garrett train. And he knew everything about this train. He knew its color. He knew how it was built. He knew the exact speed it went. And he went around the platform after my friend talking about it, talking about it. He was so full of it. He was boasting in it. And he said to my friend, do you know how many nuts and fixings are in that train? And my friend said, no, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. It's something that just fills your horizons. You delight in it. Now, Christians can be enthusiastic about all kinds of things, but the center of our boast, Paul says, I don't want to be someone who avoids the cross. I want to be someone who adores the cross. All of my boasting, whether it's boasting in the glory of God where it's boasting in the goodness of God, whether it's thankful for my life and all that I have, all of our adoring as Christians is to be an adoring of the work of Jesus on the cross. That is to be the very center of it. Look at the ways that Paul glories in the cross. May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, he boasts in it as the end of the world's claims over him, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. As Christians, we still live in this world. We live among the people of this world. But if we've trusted in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, something has happened to us. We have died with Jesus in his death. And we've been united with him in his resurrection. That means this sinful world and rebellion against God doesn't have a claim over us. Let me put it like this. If you think that what gives you purpose and meaning in life is most of all your family, your family will have a claim over you. If you think what gives you purpose and peace is having a good job and being respected at work, that will rule over you. That will be your boss. If you think that what giving a peace and purpose in life are your moral works and what you accomplish, they will rule over you and it will have a claim over you. But if the only thing that gives you peace and blessing and goodness and rightness with God is the cross... And what Jesus has done, if that is finished, nothing in this world has a claim over you. Nothing does. It can't add to your blessing. And if you lack it, it can't take away from it. 
all that you have as a Christian comes from the cross. We have died to this world and its claims. And a lot of Christian sanctification is realizing that, is realizing just how free we are. He adores the cross as the end of the world's claims over us. He adores the cross, secondly, as the beginning of the new creation. Verse 15, neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything. Paul spent the letter warning about the folly of getting circumcised. But Paul says right at the end, uncircumcision doesn't make you any better before God either. It is not about outward marks and um, accomplishments. What really counts is a new creation. The Old Testament looking forward to that day when the Messiah would come and make the world new, new righteousness, new holiness. And Paul is saying that new creation has happened. It's come into the world through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been made new because of the cross. I have a right standing with God. I am adopted as a child of God. I've been given the Holy Spirit. That new creation, not yet complete, one day fully complete when Jesus comes, but that new creation has come. I am facing forwards. So I look at the cross and what Jesus did for me there, as Jesus says, it is finished. And that is the beginning of my life. Jesus risen from the dead a new creation. So not only does the world have no claim over me, as I look to God, I have hope. I am forgiven. I am right with God. I adore what happened at the cross. Verse 16, he adores the cross as the peace of the church, the peace of God's people. He says a blessing. Those who walk by this rule, literally those who walk by this law, What is Paul talking about here? Well, those people who trust in the cross by faith alone, those people who are made new by the Holy Spirit, Christian believers, peace and mercy to them. Paul says, even to the Israel of God. Now, I think there, Paul doesn't mean something separate as, oh, peace to you, the church, but also to ethnic Israel. That word and can also be an even as it's translated in the NIV. Paul is saying, and it would be in keeping what is said throughout the whole of Galatians, is that Jew and Gentile together who trust only in Jesus Christ, they together are the church, the Israel of God, the people of God. What is the church? The church are the people who unite around the cross. Whatever they have done, wherever they are from. We glory in the cross together. That's why we've got broken bread and poured out wine. So different from different backgrounds. But we glory in the church as the end, to, we glory in the cross as the end to the world's claims over, the, over us, as the uh, beginning of the new creation in our lives, as the church's peace. And we glory in the church as the mark of discipleship. Look at verse 17. Paul says something now about the false teachers. And it's a, uh, I, I get the feeling the Apostle Paul was a little bit tetchy. Uh, here is one of his, his kind of godly, tetchy comments Let no one cause me any trouble. Stop, stop the, with this nonsense about circumcision. Why? For I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. These false teachers were all about marks in the body, the mark of circumcision as a badge of belonging to God. And Paul says, you want to see marks? You want to see marks of belonging to Jesus? He would get in the room and take his shirt off uh, and show him the places where he's been lashed and beaten for being an apostle and for preaching the cross. The real badge of Christian discipleship is a willingness to suffer for him, is a willingness to walk his way. Paul glories in the cross as a mark of his discipleship, a life that is centered 
on the cross and a life that is shaped by the cross, which means a willingness to suffer. Now, obviously, you and I are not in the same league as the Apostle Paul. We're not in the same league as brothers and sisters across the world who have suffered persecution and bear physical marks and suffering for their faith. But if you're a Christian, you've got scars for following Jesus. You've got things you've given up. You've got family relationships that are still complicated because you won't back down in the Bible because you put Jesus first. You bear scars. As the poem goes, he can't have traveled far who has no wounds, who has no scars. And that suffering, the things you've given up, marks you out. It's the way of the cross. Aim for the cross. Keep the cross before you in your Christian life. When you come to the Lord's table, meditate on what Jesus did and suffered for you. Proclaim, boast and revel in it. Join a church that's centered on the cross. Live a life. When you're straying, keep the cross before you. Maybe this morning you are tempted, deeply tempted by some sin that is deep set in. Maybe you are despairing about your lack of progress. A lot of the Christian life isn't about how far you've come. It's about where you're facing. It's about where you're looking towards. Are you facing towards Jesus? Are you facing towards him this morning? Maybe you found a way of avoiding the cross in your life in some area, maybe in your witness to others, maybe in your commitment to the church, maybe in how you give, maybe in some area that you're holding back from the Lord. Don't avoid it. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to, into that area, bow before him. And here's the question. How are you and I going to aim for the cross? Because it is so hard to do. It is the most hardest thing in the Christian life, simply to look to Jesus. We constantly wander. We constantly stray. We get ourselves into all kinds of little knots and tangles and messes. And that's the last thing I'm going to say. To keep the cross in view, there's one thing that we all need. And Paul knows that the Galatian church need it. And he knows that you and I need it. What do we need? We need grace. We need grace. We need undeserved favor and blessing because that's what the cross is all about. We don't just need grace as a uh, theory. We need, in verse 18, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with our spirits, to be with us as the reality of our lives. We need daily a fresh experience of grace. Left to myself, I would wander off, wander far, far away from the cross of Jesus. I need him to get hold of me. I need him to keep me looking to him. Let's pray that the Lord Jesus would direct our paths to his steadfast endurance, to his cross, to his resurrection. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Let's sing before we come to the Lord's table. An older hymn. Beneath.